Well, we are here at the site of ancient Makine to discuss some interesting conversations we've had lately on the podcast. We've been talking to physicists who are trying to study the foundations of nature. Among them, Steve Wolfram of Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, and then Jacob Berendes, <laughs> which I always have to pause before I say, who is also studying the foundations of reality, but he's coming at it from a totally different perspective. Wolfram is deeply mathematical. Everything is platonic forms, this like abstract nature of space and time that emerges from these computational immaterial relationships. And Berendes is more like, hey, there's probably something down there, and we ought to study it and figure it out. And what's crazy is this seems to have been a pattern of swing between these two poles that's been going on for a very, very long time. Yeah, like if you look at the atomists, Democritus, Leucippus, let's say the Stoics as well, they were, what, 600 B.C.? And they were already arguing for the fact that matter was made out of substances. And they very quickly had enemies who couldn't stomach such an idea. It's really interesting. So it's interesting because I've been reading this book about the history of atomism. And uh, it's Bernard Pullman who wrote it. It's like, The History of the Atom and Human Thought. And he's, and through the ancient Greek period of the book, and Pullman makes this interesting case, which is that we tend to think of Plato as being totally like a guy of forms. But he also kind of had an atom. No, you can't. He had these triangles. Everything for him was made out of two different types of triangles that combined into the shapes. And the shapes then kind of made the forms. And it's a little bit nebulous, but Pullman argues that Plato actually was kind of in the atomist camp, and then Aristotle was the one that really was like, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as void. There's no such thing as atoms. It is continuum. And then everybody loved Aristotle. Which I don't totally know why. Well, the church loved him as well. Seems like anybody who's trying to make some sort of mystical, supernatural argument for their authority is very much interested in the form's relational conception of fundamental reality. Yeah, and so when we talk to Wolfram, it's very much forms, concepts, ideas. When we talk to Berendes, it's very much substance, the equations are pointing at something. There is something down there. Let's walk into the city a little bit and see what's going on. The scientific revolution starts now. We come at this conversation with Wolfram and with Baron Dess with our own preconceptions. Right? It's not like we don't spend time thinking about atoms or about matter. And we kind of fall into the camp that broadly construed can be called the substantialists. I don't want to say materialists because I think that materialism is a word that has been it's been taken over by the like Reddit atheists. It's really interesting to me how Half of the people feel extremely disempowered by substantialism, and half of the people feel completely disempowered by forms. Okay, let's, let's explore that. Kind of reminds me of the schism between eternity and birth of the universe. And it seems to me like it's a similar camp of people who are comfortable with eternity, right? When we're talking to Berendes, he's very much comfortable with eternity. When I survey my students every year, half of them are very much comfortable with eternity when we discuss alternatives to the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. The other half are completely uncomfortable with eternity. And I have the feeling that the Epicureans and the Substantialists and the Atomists were very comfortable with eternity. And I'm really interested in how these two camps split along these lines, cosmologically as well as fundamentally. Like today, we still give cosmology to the physicists, mm -hmm. who are largely platonic, mathematicians at this point, right? They have a birth of the universe story. 
and there's no material basis for fundamental physics anymore. Everything is fields of quantity. But so how do you think that this idea of fields of quantity relates to, in, to a finite universe that has a birth? Because that's kind of weird to me, I intuitively. Have a, I have a feeling that it's all ideologically controlled by a priest class. Like, I feel like civilization is subject to a foundational myth in all cases. And the foundational myth for the priest class is always that we understand answers to impossible questions like, where did this place come from? And they have to embrace this relational methodology, this quantitative approach, this form approach, because it is sufficiently nebulous and mystical that you have to surrender some part of your rationality to it. That was something that was something that really I noticed when we were talking to Wolfram, right? Where what is Wolfram's idea? Wolfram's idea is that there is a set of computational rules that produces what? reality. And the computations are run not upon matter, right? So when we're talking to him, he's like, these are atoms of space. And you're like, what is that? And he's like, it's a point. And there's a point everywhere. And the point has uh, a past and a future. And it's calculating its future based on its past and its present vector. But it's not like atoms or rocks or anything like that. It's not a physical body in space that is doing something. Like you asked him even during the, the conversation, you were like, well, is this made of something? And yeah. he's like, no, he was... <laughs> <laughs> he was <in> question. <laughs> it was atoms of space. Obviously, it's not made of anything. It is space. And so as he's saying this, it's very hard to not feel like... <laughs> This is exactly what you're saying. It's, it's a thing that you have to give yourself over to, to accept that this is this beyond belief feature of nature. And he does his best to make the case, which way? He does his best to make the case that this is okay, right? That this is how it should be. Which I think resonates with a lot of people because the substance, in the poetic sense, the substance of their lives is not material, right? Mm -hmm. It's relational. Like, what is the most important thing to people when they're dying? It's like always their family, friends, the experiences they've had. Mm -hmm. This kind of goes without saying. Mm -hmm. People don't really, in the long run, value, value material possessions. They realize from the earliest moment they can't take them with them. So you think that it's just a reflection of the fact that people value relationships more than they value stuff? 100%. And I think that's a valuable perspective. The problem, Go ahead. The problem becomes when we set out to do a project like physics and we're like, hey, let's try to explain why a rock has these properties, you know, whether that's its ability to turn and melt into metal or magnetism or how brittle it is. And we say, hey, we're going to try to solve this problem materially. We're going to give material explanations for why this physical feature of reality, say this rock, behaves the way it does. And physics as a discipline, from everything I can tell, in the past revolves around a project like this. But at some point in the late, I don't know, 19th, early 20th century, physics completely departed from this project. Well, the case is that it wasn't in the 19th century where they departed, right? It was the fact that it's always kind of been like this, where 2,000 years ago, they're arguing about the nature of reality, where it's either atoms or forms. There is a pendulum, but it swung back in the mechanical direction for a while after the Enlightenment, from what I can tell. In, in kind of a weird way, right? Because people recognized, it seems like, 
that there were corpuscles or some kind of material that was involved in physics. But at the same time, they were never really able to deal with force. Energy. Especially things that act at a distance, right? So if you have a fluid, if you have a gas, I think that it's somehow easier to conceive of there being subunits and those subunits doing stuff because there's, uh, in Pullman's book, he has this thing where he's like, it's a quote from someone that I can't remember, maybe Whitehead, where he's like, if dust had not been such a uniform feature of the world, it might very well be that our conception of gases as being made of little motes of stuff that are bumping around would have taken much longer for us to come to. Hmm. Because dust is kind of in the air, you can look at it, you can see what it does, it's got patterns, it's got whorls, it's sort of this macroscopic representation of something that must be happening at a lower level. And with stuff like electricity and magnetism, we don't really have anything, or gravity, we don't have anything that even looks like that. Right, but it is interesting that by the 19th, 18th, 19th century, the revitalization of science as this experimental method, people were, by and large, assuming that there was some sort of mode of dust situation. They assumed this luminiferous ether at the heart of everything. It only fell away when they introduced this relativistic solution to the problem, like, hey, we can just not deal with the ether and move on. And they failed to detect it as this kind of plum pudding thing that everything ba was bathed in. But I think it was also that the discovery of the wave nature of electromagnetism threw a real ratchet into the gears. Because the problem was all of a sudden that it wasn't this nice acoustic oscillation. It wasn't just the displacement of subunits in this uh, let's just stick with displacement of subunits in a kind of sound-like way. Compression. Compressional, right? It was this bizarre transverse oscillation. And when you start asking questions like, well, what is oscillating exactly? You get back to the idea that, wait, it's actually the polarity of the emitting or receiving side of the light transaction that's oscillating. The electric polarity. People are like, what the hell does a polarizable medium mean? How do you polarize a medium? And so they got really hung up on that, from what I can tell, for most of the 19th century. And then when relativity came along, they were like, thank God, we don't have to deal with this problem anymore. Because you can't polarize sound waves, basically. Can you? You don't need to. Well, that's not what I, but I'm even talking about capacity, right? So. Well, it would mean something totally different. Like, like what would a polarized sound wave be? Uh, it would just be like directionally. So, for instance, these microphones that we're using have a uh, omnidirectional, omni, that's a word, omnidirectional polarization. Uh, but you could have a really tight cardioid polarization, right, where the the reception of the antenna of these sound waves is only picking up in one little region, right? Mm -hmm. It's filtered in such a way that it only picks up on a narrow path, and that would be called polarization. But it's not really the same as electromagnetic polarization because when, with sound, you're talking about still compression and, de and displacement of subunits in this compressional fashion. Sounds like what you're describing is the polarization of the receiver, not of the medium. I think so, yeah. I, I don't know. Well, right, because the sound in the room doesn't change yeah. depending on cardioid or omni yeah. or figure eight. Yeah. There's some mathematical process that's running on the inside of the microphone that's deciding phase relationships and what to cancel. Right. And so polarization in that sense is not polarization of the medium. No, no, no. I don't think so. I don't think in any case. And so that's the question. I'm like, is it just impossible to conceive of a polarizable sound wave? Polarized sound wave? Like, gases seem impossible to polarize. Yeah, it's a collisional emotion, and this luminiferous ether, the medium of, of electromagnetism... is sine waves. It's sine waves, but the, what, is si what is waving? And it turns out to be the polarity of the field, which is really just a property of, that's inferred from the travel 
and what's what's evidence that the receiver and the emitter right which is oscillating polarity of electric field right so like you're always talking about antennas as being kind of the quintessential way of studying this 